So now in this last uh, video, we're still continuing our discussion on the role of natural selection in microevolution. We established the idea of natural selection acting on the phenotype and then changing the allele frequency, causing all this phenotypic variation that we see in many different populations. And then we saw the complexity of variation. We saw the idea of polymorphism, polymorphic traits. It's not just this or that. You can be a, in a range, in a continuum, and that's usually defined by polygenic control. Many genes controlling the trait at different loci creating a continuum, creating a range of phenotypes, short all the way to tall, but then we have a range that establishes itself on a bell curve, a normal distribution. Let's take that information, okay, lots of information that I just summarized for you there, and let's turn it around. Let's, let, let's, let's cause some differences to what we expect, aka I'm going to be doing the following in this video. Well, what we're going to be doing is we're actually going to be changing, okay, and this is seen in real life, this happens, changing the normal distribution, remember the normal distribution is just that basic bell curve that we drew in our previous video, changing the normal distribution via a very powerful mechanism of evolution called natural selection, via natural selection, but specifically, I actually want to say um, not just natural selection, but specifically selection. Think of the selection term more specifically. I'm going to be selecting certain individuals out of this normal distribution more so than others. This is what I mean by this. There are three ways to change the normal distribution. What you can have is first called the stabilizing selection. You can have stabilizing selection within a population that is otherwise normal, but then we're going to have stabilizing selection. Stabilizing selection will be defined as the following. It's a selection that favors, that absolutely favors the intermediate variants more so than anybody else. AKA, those people that are in the middle of the, of the bell curve will definitely be more successful than anybody else. Okay, And there are real life examples of these things favors the intermediate variants, um, we actually are going to be selecting against the extreme. So this selects against the extremes. So we don't want the extremes in this stabilizing selection scenario. And I'll draw this out for you. And what happens is the phenos usually for this situation, the people who are successful in this situation are successful and they are in their intermediate state because the phenotypes um, are usually uh, there and present for a stable environment. So if you have a stable environment, you expect natural selection to choose the intermediates to be more successful. You expect natural selection to put a pressure against the extremes. So watch this, this is gonna be pretty cool. Let's imagine I have my normal bell curve, right? I have my normal bell curve such as this, right? And what I'm gonna do is, I'm going to put some pressure against the extremes. AKA, I'm gonna take this bell curve and anywhere where I see extremes, AKA the two ends, I'm gonna push down on. Imagine you're physically pushing down on this graph right here. What do you expect this graph to change into? How will its shape change? Imagine this is, uh, you know, some sort of maneuverable plastic like uh, clay-like scenario in which you're pushing down on these two extreme ends. You're selecting against them. You're pushing them down. You're saying less of you. I this is the amount of people on the y-axis and this is the, the trait over here. You're saying, I want less of this, less of this. What's going to happen? You're going to get a stabilizing selection scenario in which you're going to cause, um, see how there's this many of these people? Let's make it very little and we're going to push this up like this, and that's our result. This is what natural selection just selected for and against. It selected against those that are, this is our normal, this is our normal right here, normal distribution, and this is natural selection selecting against over here, and over here, this is our stabilized, okay? This is stabilized, stabilizing selection. Okay, so that's a pretty cool way of understanding it. Your textbook has much better figures than this and great examples as well. So let's move forward. Let's see a different type. There's another type to change the normal distribution, and that is called directional selection. So this is exactly what the name implies, in which a certain direction is going to be favored more so than the others, in the sense that this is simply um, favoring one extreme. Directional ex ex uh, selection favors one extreme. 
So let's do the same exact thing. Let's imagine we have our normal distribution. Let me try to draw this as normally as possible. So it's just this, okay, that's our normal distribution. And let me say that, um, let's imagine that there's some sort of a catastrophic event, and that catastrophic event says anybody who's at this side of the bell curve of the normal distribution, I'm going to push down against you and really push you lower in the population. I'm going to make sure there's less of you and I'm going to direct select. This is directional selection for those individuals on the other side. So if you imagine yourself pushing down on this you know, imaginary graph, what I expect to see in the next scenario out of this normal distribution is sort of something like this. I have a very low amount of these and I have a I've just literally pushed the graph to the side. And that's exactly what has happened. You have selected, remember how these are the middle individuals? You're favoring one extreme, aka you're favoring everybody on this side. Look what you've done. Everybody on this side, there's lots and lots of these individuals. There's a lot of them on this side. And you have very few of these. Um, this is natural selection pushing against these individuals and natural selection is going to end up with this result as a directional selection. And then again, this is microevolution happening on a small scale and we can actually observe and do observe this. I highly suggest looking at your textbook and seeing the real life examples of these. They're pretty cool. And the last one is the disruptive selection. A lot of people like this one. Um, disruptive selection is uh, basically against everything that you usually would think would happen. This is actually, if this favors one extreme and this favors no extremes, what do you uh, think this one, disruptive selection, is going to favor? This is going to actually favor both extremes. It actually favors um, both extremes. So this is a little crazy right now. This graph is going to look very, very interesting. Um, uh, favors both extremes, specifically over the intermediates. The intermediates are the ones that are not going to be successful. And lastly, this is usually seen when the environment is very variable meaning that it's changing all the time, it's crazy, so the people that who are the most extreme are going to be successful. So let's do this again, let's do a normal distribution graph right over here. So this is my normal distribution like this, try to draw this as normally as possible, in which I have a few of these, a majority in the middle and a very few um, at the ends. Disruptive selection is natural selection saying no more of you guys, no more of you in the middle. You guys have had all the power, you guys are the most successful. I'm going to push down on this graph and if you imagine your finger pushing down on this graph, the result of this is going to be the fact that you're going to create um, two sort of humps. You're going to create a dip over here because you push down but then you're going to create a rise over here and then another rise over here because of that pushing down that you've done. Look what you've done. You have favored this extreme. You have favored this extreme. These were the extremes before. Look at them after. They are so much more of these individuals here. Look how many there are. So much more here. Look how many there aren't here. You've pushed down against this natural selection. Has chosen against the people that are intermediate and you get this disruptive selection. So that covers the three types of natural uh, selection that are seen in microevolution. You should understand them. The graphs, I think, really, really help understanding it. And that covers our idea, uh, our overall theme, an overall lecture of microevolution altogether. Um, just a couple of summarizing points. Let's just remember that evolution, um, uh, I'll just do this right over here. I'll do a quick summary of everything that we've done. I'll just section this out like this. Quick summary. What we want to know and understand is that evolution, I'll just say evo, what was that? Uh, summary. Evolution itself only happens if there's genetic variation. Only if there's Genvar. Okay, that's something you should take away from this lecture. You should also understand and take away from this lecture that allele frequencies not altered um, by inheritance alone. Okay, they are not altered and we prove this very much so with our examples by inheritance alone. Okay, you have to have outside effects aka 
evolution, these type of effects you need. You need natural selection. Um, in addition to that, um, outside agents, just like I said, I spoiled it for myself, outside agents. Remember those agents that we said weren't acting in equilibrium? Well, in reality, outside agents do act, and those actions are going to change the allele frequencies. Okay, so outside agents change allele frequencies, but they are not absolutely changed simply by inheritance alone. So this is all in titling and sort of covering microevolution. Microevolution are changes, so microevolution, one final repetitive definition, changes in allele frequency, that's what evolution really is, okay? Changes in allele frequency, but over here, small changes in allele frequency over a few generations. And uh, in our next lecture, we're going to be looking at macroevolution, macro meaning big. And this is going to be important because we're actually going to be seeing big changes, um, not over a few generations, but over a very, very long time. Very different type of lecture, but a very interesting lecture nonetheless. Hopefully you've understood and gotten a greater appreciation, of course, for the complexity associated with microevolution. Understand, I, I know that the Hardy-Weinberg seems like, why do I have to learn about this? It absolutely is not real, but it's not real, and thus we can use it as a perfect scenario to compare reality with. It's a powerful, powerful tool. Hopefully you got that from this lecture.